That's exactly right, Matt. They follow the exact same outline. And when I mean exact same, I don't mean like they're all word for word with one another, but they all follow the same pattern uh, of the life and ministry of Jesus. doesn't mean they're exactly the same. For example, Mark makes no mention whatsoever of the birth of Jesus. Uh, you know, Mark's gospel begins with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ and jumps right into the ministry of John the baptizer, you know, in verse 3 and 4. Uh, but, uh, and Matthew mentions Jesus' birth in, in a very limited way, and then a little bit about his early days when they went to Egypt. You know, Luke begins all the way back with the birth of John the Baptist, and then the birth of Christ, and, and those types of things. But then once we get to that adult stage of Christ's life, there's a, there's a pattern. You're going to see you're going to see uh, you're going to see the same accounts uh, in like in two or three. You know, you may find, for example, the account of the and we'll talk about this. And I think it's in lesson forty uh, with the uh, uh, the Gadarenes. You know, the, the 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 demoniac legion. You know, some of these are found and and but they're not found. You know, you know none of as best I can tell, none of the parables that we can read of in the synoptics are found in John's gospel. John's just not a, John just was not a parable writer. Uh, his emphasis was completely different. So they're called the synoptics because they follow the same general pattern of detailing the life and the ministry of Jesus. All right? Uh, now, rather looking at question two, I'm going to, I'm going to change that up a little bit to go back to uh, it, the question is what parables what parables and that's not the correct it should say parables provide or parable provides but a key to understanding parables and I, I think we ask, should ask the question what is the key to understanding parables in general or what are the keys to understanding parables in general there are two things we talked about in the last two sessions two things two things one is understand the figure understand the figure and we use that as an example you know a sower went out to sow you know there are there, you know there's a, obviously there's a sense in which there are some people in the world that would not understand that figure because he's talking about walking around and scattering seed by scattering seed by hand and you know, I made the note uh, that uh, you know when I was young that uh, that you know we sold wheat in the same fashion in which it's described in this parable, scattered. You know, there was a buggy full of seed, and we'd run from one end to the other just about as fast as you could go, just scattering the seed. You know, on the on the bare ground. Of course, now they don't do that anymore. You know, they drill. You know, they got a wheat drill. Um, I was talking to Brett last week. He's somebody. He's going to drill. He's going to drill fescue in some of his horse pastures, or I mean, his cow pastures. You know, whereas you know, used to it's just a straight spreading overseed. And so, uh, and so, we have to understand. You know, we have to understand the the figure uh, in, in these things. Uh, we talked about under, <laughs> understanding the figure of the dragnet. You know, God, you know, God's race in sub-Saharan Africa is not going to understand the parable of the dragnet. He's never seen the ocean. He's never seen a boat. <laughs> He's never seen a net. And so, and so we want to understand, we want to understand the figure. And then secondly, we want to ascertain the lesson. In other words, once we understand the figure, then we go to understanding, trying to understand what is, what is this thing trying to teach us? And, and usually it'll be reasonably obvious uh, um, you know I think the one in mark 4 uh, 26 about you know just the uh, the the parable of the tares or the, you know the farmer who just spreads the seed and waits for the harvest that that one was a little more cryptic you know it, it was teaching about uh, that the need for patience you know that something you know some things we plant we can't tend to them after they're planted. Now you plant corn, you gotta tend to it. You plant, you know, peas, you gotta tend to it. You know, but if you're planting millet, barley, wheat, you know, once it's scattered, you're done. You don't tend to it. You don't you don't you don't hoe it out or or, or whatever. And so that, that one was a little more cryptic. But uh, once we <laughs> once we understand the figure, then we can understand or try to ascertain what the figure 
uh, or what the what the parable, what in other words, what is the lesson that is thrown beside uh, the account? And then the last thing is one that I added is do not overextend the parable. Do not overextend the parable. In other words, don't try to make it say something that it that is not intended for it to say. For example, I used again in the parable of the sower. Uh, don't overextend it to think that three out of four people are going to respond to the preaching of the gospel. You know, because that's really what the parable is about. The sower is sowing the seed, he's preaching the gospel. And three out of the four soil types respond in some favorable way to the preaching of the gospel. Now, I mean, obviously we know that's never going to be the case. It wasn't the case in the days of Jesus. It wasn't the case in the days of the apostles. I mean, we could even in the even in the account of the day of Pentecost, three thousand people obeyed the gospel. But that was still a minority of the people who would have been in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. I mean, literally tens or hundreds of thousands of, of people, and tens of thousands would have perhaps been in the in the very temple grounds and area. And so 3,000 is a huge number, but it's not as big a number as you think in comparison to the number as a whole. So we don't want to overextend the parable into thinking that three-fourths of the people are going to respond in some way uh, favorably to the gospel. But then we said we could possibly draw a conclusion that a, 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 small, a smaller number of, and I wouldn't, I, I don't want to try to break it down into 33%, 33%, and 33%. But that a smaller a smaller portion of Christians are fruitful than perhaps we might think in our own in our own minds. And by the way, I'm preaching about that today. Uh, uh, the sermon this morning is, "What will you leave to follow Jesus?" But there's a you know there's a lesson for us to learn in that that not everybody that responds to the gospel is going to stick it out. You know, the stony, the stony ground is the Christian who falls away. And I mentioned last week, you know, how many, how many unfaithful Christians are there within a five-mile radius of this building or a ten-mile radius of this building? You know, nearly, you know, nearly every single congregation in this county could just about double overnight if just the unfaithful Christians would come home. That's stony, that's the stony ground. Then you've got the unfruitful Christian. It has the appearance of being a Christian the, 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 in the thorny ground. There's the appearance of being a Christian. And yet there's no real fruit being born. And, that, you know, that, and that's the Christian you're going to find in the building on Sunday mornings. You know, he hasn't fallen away. He's still there. He's still visible. But he's not bearing fruit. And there's probably more of those than we would like than that we would like to to think about. And in essence, it would say if if we were going to try to draw that parallel, that fifty per, that'd be fifty percent of all Christians that are in the building are unfruitful. And that might be a closer number. That might be a closer number than we're comfortable to, than talk, to talk about. But fifty percent, you know, two two out, you know, two out of the or one out of the two that's still in the building. And we might draw that parallel a little closer, even though I don't think that's exactly what the Lord uh, is trying to teach us. But we don't want to overextend the meaning of, uh, of the parable or overextend uh, uh, the application. All right, question four is, what does each soil represent? The heart. The heart. The hearts of men. Now, what <laughs> this is, what message is taught in the parable of the sower? I tell you that. What messages are taught in the parable of the sower? No, just you know, give me, give me anything. To keep yeah, keep sowing. <laughs> you know, don't quit sowing. Just you know, the Bible says the sower sows the seed. You know, and and he just you know he keeps on he keeps on sowing the seed. We want to, uh, and I might say this. First of all, it might be the case that we need to start sowing. Start sowing. And then we got to keep sowing. Don't be discouraged because we're not responsible for what the heart does with that word. That is the fourth thing I had in my list. That the soil, 
The soil is responsible for its uh, the soil is responsible for its reaction to the seed. In other words, it's not our it's not our responsibility to force people or coerce them into uh, into respond what we would say responding favorably uh, to the gospel. Um, thus, we would also could also add to what John just said is that. Um, the power is in the seed and not in the sower. It's not in us. What? I said it's not in us. That's it's right. We're just, we're just That's right. You know, but, but, but again, you still have to have both things, don't you? You have to have the seed and the sower. The seed won't sow itself, and the sower can't make it grow. And so, you know, the life, the germ is in the seed, but it still takes a sower to sow the seed. And so you can't have one... Uh, uh, you can't have effectiveness of one uh, without the other. If he's not sowing, if he's not sowing the gospel, then that's not good. And if there, and if the gospel's not being sown by anyone, that is also not good. And then the fourth thing, or fifth thing, I had was is that we don't discriminate as regard to soil type. <coughs> it didn't say a soil inspector went forth to sow. It says a sower went forth to sow, and we want to be, make sure that that we don't that we don't withhold that we don't withhold seed from soil that we think will be uh, that we think will be unfruitful. That's right. The command that we are given is to go and teach or go and sow. All right. So again, a number of messages. Uh, uh, question six: What is the what is the chief characteristic of the wayside soil? What's the chief characteristic of the wayside soul? There's a word that says our unsteadiness. Well, that's the result, but I, I would guess, I would ask, why? In other words, what, what, <laughs> you know, what, what is it about the soil that, that brings about the result that's in the parable? Yeah, the, there's the, there's a, a lack of interest in the spiritual. It's only an interest in in the material. Notice, how about this? It's hard paying, right? It's hard paying because when he talks about wayside, you know, the the, the again understanding the figure, the, the the picture, you know, the picture is that some of it fell out in the path that the sower was walking because you had fields. You know, you had fields, and then you had the walkways that people, you know, traveled in between the fields from one place to another. And so, it, you know, it'd be, uh, you know, it, there'd be a, 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 a tremendous amount of foot traffic. Uh, there would be animal traffic. I mean, it'd just be, it'd be, you know, it'd be stomp, stomped down. It, it reminds me of, now I don't know if this is true or not, John would probably know better than me. But I heard a guy say one time, he said, if you have a pond that won't hold water, put hogs in it. And, uh, and said, if you'll, if you'll put hogs in it for a while, they'll have that thing stomped down so much that it just, it'll never leak water. Well, that's the principle of the wayside soil. People and animals have walked this path until it's, you know, it's, it's dirt, but it's hard as a rock. And if, you can look, you can walk in the woods. Oh, Tommy's old place? Yeah, Tommy's old place. There's a, there's a wagon truck through the woods, mm -hmm. and it's just as clear. Right? They have saplings in the middle above yep. where, the, where the wheel broke. Yeah. Well, you can even see it in the, in the woods you know, where, where deer walk. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to see where deer walk in the woods. They've got it trampled down. They walk that path so so regularly that you know, you, nothing, you know, nothing will grow there. And so that's the that's the wayside soil. It's just trampled so hard that nothing you know nothing will ever grow there. Uh, what are the characteristics of the rocky soil? Quickly. What's a you know what's a primary characteristic of, of the rocky soil? There's one or two things you could at least two things you might mention. 
All right, so not enough, too much rock, not enough soil. All right, which really, and then thus that describes that it's it's shallow. There's no depth. You know, it says there's no depth of earth, which is saying there's not enough soil. <laughs> there's not enough soil. And uh, but but we but we also see how we also see how a seed can sprout quickly under those conditions. That it, you know, if it gets hidden so it doesn't get eaten by a bird and it gets just a little bit of moisture and direct sunlight, that thing's going to heat up in a hurry, right? And when it heats up, it's going to, you know, the germ is it's going to sprout. The picture I always remember in my mind is the soybeans that were growing behind the seat of my dad's uh, El Camino. I mean behind the front seat. <laughs> I don't mean in the bed. I mean there were some soybeans that got spilled in the back of that El Camino and they got wet and in the summertime they got hot and about two or three days later there's bean sprouts in that in that thing. By the way, if you've ever hauled any kind of grain in, in the bed of your pickup truck and you didn't get it washed all the way out, you've seen it. I mean I can't tell you how many times I've seen you know corn, you know, corn germinate, you know, you know, uh, wheat, just all types of things germinate in the bed of your truck because they get, they get wet, they get hot, and they do what the Lord made them to do. They, they sprout. But, of course, you're not going to make a crop, you know, in the back of your pickup truck for the same reason. There's no depth. There's no depth of earth. And the earth, you know, provides a lot of things for the seed. You know, it provides the nutrients. It provides the protection. It holds the moisture. You know, there are so many things that the, that are, that the soil does uh, for the seed. And so without, the, without that depth of earth, without that soil, the seed's going to sprout. But it's not going to last. You know, I've, you know I've, I've baptized a lot of people in 30 years that just didn't make it very long. Yeah, I mean, I I have, I mean, I, I'll, I can give you an example that happened here where, uh, where a person was wanting to be baptized and I discovered in the process of this whole thing that uh, this individual was trying to escape the consequences of their actions. Not like with the law, but I mean with with another individual, and 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 this person thought, well, if I can, you know, if, if this person can watch me be baptized, then they'll then they'll believe that I'm truly sorry for what I did, and it and the, and the, and the thing was, you know, the individual was only sorry for offending and had, gave no thought to the fact that that you know that God had been offended. You know, wasn't worried about being reconciled to God over this thing. Was trying to be reconciled to another individual. It, it was a, obviously it's a boyfriend girlfriend situation. All right, and so um, you know that you know that just doesn't work. That just doesn't work. You know that person really didn't truly obey the gospel. But I have seen people that I believe truly obeyed the gospel that didn't last very long. Um, and you know sometimes that's on. I'll just say you know sometimes that's on me. Because you know, Luke fourteen says you got you got to count the cost. You know Luke fourteen twenty six, and you know a lot of times a lot of times we are so excited that people appear to want to do right that they don't they're not properly instructed on what it means to to truly obey the gospel. You know and I can I can see that in this stony soil. All right, what about the thorny soil? What's the characteristic of the thorny soil? It's choked out. Cares about yeah, cares of, cares of the world, but it, it's not choked out in the, in the sense of MMA where they tap out and it's over. <laughs> it's choked out in the sense it's choked out in the sense that that no right. There's no yeah. There's no consideration given to to what its true purpose is, and you know, and the cares of this world. By the way, the cares of this world are not necessarily things that are sinful. 
It just means the, thing, the things that come on us in this world end up taking precedent over the spiritual things. Yeah, what's most important ends up taking a back seat to what is not of vital importance. You know, the cares of this world could include our jobs. Now, look, we all understand. Not only, look, y'all know that in America today, you don't have to work, unfortunately. But, but, but we understand it, that, that, that we're supposed to work, right? We're supposed to work. Uh, I got to just share this with you. I was talking to my, my cousin yesterday at the reunion, and uh, he's been a psychiatrist for about 40 plus years. And the one thing he said is, he said, I'm still, he's still practicing. He still has a full-time job. He says, he says, I'm not going to retire. He said, because I've watched too many guys retire and it doesn't work out well for them. And the, the conclusion that he and I were both talking about is that a man is made to work. You know, he, he, it's not, he, he, has to re, he has to replace his employment with something. He can't, you know, a man is not just made to sit, you know, and watch, you know, watch Judge Judy and, you know, eat cheese puffs and drink Mountain Lightning all day. So, you know, you know, but there, there's, there's a work, you know, we're supposed to work. God expects us to work. He commands us to work. But if we pursue work, you know, to too great of an extent, it, Gets in, it can get in the way of our spiritual growth and development. You know, our recreation, our kids. You know, our kids. You know, are a ble are, You know, children are a blessing or a heritage from the Lord. You know, but some too many too many parents are allowing their children to take them away from their spiritual growth and development. It. it it's almost like there's there's almost been a transformation in my lifetime. You know, when I when I was a kid, you know, the thing was always, you know, dads work too much and they neglect their families. Y'all remember hearing those types of things in the '60s and '70s and pursuing the American dream and you know the, you know the dads always at work. You know, you've got the you got the Harry Chapin song, "Cats in the Cradle." You know, the reason that song is so popular is because it was so true. <laughs> you know, it was so true. But now, but now in, in, our, in our day and time that, you know, we've become so affluent that, you know, our, you know, say if we worked 40 or even 50 hours a week rather than 70 or 80 like they used to, you know, we can make a really good living. But then all that other time is devoted to, to you know, chasing our kids all over the place or carrying them all, you know, carrying them all over the countryside. And again, there you know the 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 church takes a back seat to these things. That's the cares of this life. Again, it's not anything that's necessarily sinful, but it's things that we that we elevate to a higher place of priority and importance than our own and our own family's spiritual growth and development and our life in the church. Of course, then we have the good soil. I think we all understand uh, what good soil. Uh, uh, represents question 10 is what does the seed represent in the parable very two two things are there's two sorry there are two descriptions the most well-known one is in luke 8 verse 11 it says the seed is what seed is the word of god the seed is the word of god then in uh in Matthew's account, in Matthew 13, 19, it says that the seed, it doesn't say the seed, but it implies that it's talking about the seed, is the word of the kingdom. In other words, more than just the word of God, the word of the kingdom. Talking about, obviously, the, the, the church that Jesus came to, to establish and shed his blood uh, 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 to purchase. You know, uh, Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in Acts 8 in verses 5 through 12 uh, to the people of, of Samaria. So there has, to be, there has to be some form of emphasis on the kingdom, and that is uh, also uh, the, the church. All right, down to the bottom, the bottom uh, 
uh, question because we've already talked about 11, 12, 13, and 14. Uh, how can a good and honest heart be identified? Or when I say, how, how, how can good soil be identified? By the actions. What do you mean by the actions? By the fruit. By the fruit that's produced. Yeah, not, you know, not by visible inspection. You know, not by visible inspection. You know, we, we sow the seed and we know which soil is good soil based on, based on the end result of what happens when that soil, uh, when that soil produces fruit. And again, we have to remember this. Just because somebody initially obeys the gospel still doesn't make them good soil. I mean, isn't that what, isn't that, what that, that parable ultimately teaches us? You know, that good soil is not the soil that immediately responds and produces a plant. The good soil is the, is the soil that receives the seed, produces a plant, and then bears fruit. Again, and two out of, two out of three respondents to the gospel in, the, in this parable, okay, two out of three of the respondents are not good soil. Uh, I'm going to share something with you that uh, Woodson uh, shared with us in a Bible class about 15 years ago in uh, Winfield, and uh, it's always stuck with me because Woodson had already retired from teaching Greek at Freed Harmon and you know, he had spent 40 years as a, as a Bible professor and he said to us one night me and Vance were sitting next to one another and he said, he said I never saw this in all, my, in all my days of reading about the parable of sower he said I never saw this he goes, he goes and I read it in Barclay's commentary Barclay's is a little old comp there's a whole set of Barclay's in the, in the church office it's not a very deep commentary it's a very small more of a summary of the various books than a commentary um and so he says, he says, look at, he says, look at the descriptive, the descriptive verbs, the descriptive verbs that mark the good soil. All right, open your Bibles to Matthew 13. In Matthew 13. Just a second, I'm going to make one more. I need to make one more observation here in my own mind as, I, as I'm going through here. Okay. In Matthew's account, in Mark's account, and in Luke's account, there's one com there's one commonality before the bearing of fruit, all right, with regard to the good soil, and the first thing is always hears, hears. Is it there in Matthew 13 and verse number 23? You find it there. The first thing is he hears, all right. That's also found in Mark's account, and it's also found in Luke's account. Hears, he who hears. But then what's the second thing after he hears? Understands. He understands. The word there means it's joined in his mind. It's joined in his mind. He, in other words, he, he's, not, he's not confused by what he hears. He understands what he hears. All right? So remember that. Or you can write it down on your, on your sheet there. He understands. All right, let me ask you a question. Did the rich young ruler understand what Jesus said to him? He did. And then he made a decision, right? But he, there was no question. He understood what Jesus was saying, right? All right. So, was the rich young ruler good soil? Was it good soil? No. So it's got to be more than just to understand. By the way, when Paul talked to uh, Felix, he says he reasoned with him about righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, and Felix did what? Trembled. 
Did he understand? He understood. Was he good soil? No, he was not. He understood, but he was not good soil. So there's Matthew's account. The good soil hears the word and understands it. Now let's go to Mark's account in Mark chapter 4. Verse number 20. Number 20. Here's the word. And depending on your translation. Let's say, Ashley. Accepts it. Who's got a King James Bible? Got it open. Receives, Receives it. Accepts it, receives it. The word there uh, in, it indicates the idea of taking in food. Receives it. So you know, you know, you, you, know, you can eat all you want. By the way, you know this is a you know there's an eating disorder where people eat and then they go and they what's called purge, right? In other words, they force themselves to to vomit. They eat, and then they vomit it up. So they don't receive what they eat, right? It, it gets on the inside, but it doesn't stay on the inside. Receives, receives or accepts the word. By the way, uh, I wish I wish one of our school teachers was in here. I could, I could ask, or, or just a parent. I guess anybody that's a parent, you know. Just because you rebuke your child don't mean they receive it. Isn't that right? Just because you rebuke your child doesn't mean they accept it or receive it. And when they don't, you know, good things don't happen. All right? So the good soul is the one who hears the word, understands the word, accepts the word or receives the word. Now let's go to Luke's account. In Luke chapter 8. Put the germ in it. That's right. You can you can chemically reproduce it, but you can't put the germ in it. account the good soul and, and in Luke's account and in King, New King James says having heard the word so here's there the hears is still there having heard the word does what verse uh, uh, verse 15 Luke 8 15 having heard the word does what Keeps it. Keeps it. So now we have three, we have three descriptive imperatives for the good soul. Has to, well, actually four. Has to hear the word. Because that because it, we know that's true because the 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 bad the, the wayside soul doesn't even hear the word. Right? So they gotta hear the word understand the word receive the word and what keep the word that's the that's the indicator that's the indicators of a good soil but isn't it interesting that that in all in all three gospel accounts a different descriptive 
imperative is found. It's not technically it's not an imperative, it's an indicative. It tells what it did. But it's imperative for us to understand. It's imperative for us to receive or accept. And it's an imperative for us to keep. But all three accounts give different uh, give different words on what the good soil does with that seed and get, and progressively and look I know that the, the, the gospels aren't arranged in out in chronological order Marx was probably the first I think most people believe that but in appearance Matthew you know, Matthew understand mark receive Luke keep and so you know we learned we learned that with regard to the seed. Johnny. I uh, when we started when you started this in thirteen, you noticed that uh, of the other three calls, the seed fell upon or among and then the good soil it fell into. Oh man. Yeah. That's what we got to see. Well, and you talking about the Matthews? Yeah. Amongst. Man, I like that. Yeah, it fell into Oh man, that's good. Another one. All right, so now we've already had, we've already had a bell, but let's let's. All right, so now what's our application there? What's our application there? All right, let me ask you this: Would it? Would it? Even though it's not in the parable, would it be reasonable for us to? To, uh, would it be reasonable for us to assume that there is a process by which we can manipulate the soil to make it more suitable for planting? By the way, the word manipulate is not a negative word. This simply means to, to, to take something and fix it or, or, or rearrange it, right? So, you know, so what does... So, so, so you, know, you, know, what's, you know, what are all the farmers fixing to do right now? I ain't nobody here plowing. Now, now among them, they'll be plowing. They're already plowing. But what? And, and and what's the purpose of plowing? To make the soil to receive the seed. But what are, what are our what are our guys fixing to start doing? Drilling. Drilling. That's right. And what are they going to do before they drill? They're going to kill the weeds. They're going, to, you know, they're going to spray a burned down herbicide to kill the weeds and then they're going to drill the seed into the ground. And so either, either by plowing or spraying, they're going to do what? They're going to get rid of the weeds. And then fertilize. So yes, we can manipulate the soil in some ways to make it more receptive to the seed. Hey, by the way, look in your books and make sure... Make sure, do you have lesson 40? 